big shout out to my family at Jim Dunlop Guitar Products. This podcast wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for my time and the uh, mentorship I received from Jimmy Dunlop himself and that whole entire team. Their creative team is incredible. Can't say enough about Jim Dunlop guitar products. The picks in particular, MXR and Crybaby, but I love the guitar picks. There's a lot of really great guitar picks out in the world. A lot of small time companies making really great things. I've got a lot of them. At the end of the day, my favorite picks are Jim Dunlop and I love the Ultem. I love of the 73 flow is my number one favorite this is right here my custom pick see the siege logo on the back and hologram hot stamp you can order your own picks customized from jim dunlop as well they are incredible as a company they make great products they own the pick game as everybody knows you can make good picks it's not like other people don't make good picks but dunlop makes most of them so that's what's up uh thank you jim dunlop for supporting the podcast Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you to the team there. Players Pick Podcast. Picks and Perspective with Chris Johnson. Jake. How are you, man? Pretty good. How you doing? Good, man. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah. It's good to see you. Likewise. I was just sitting here thinking, I'm like, when's the last time I even saw Jake? And uh, I'm probably Nam, maybe. It could have been. Yeah, I guess it could have been Nam before the the fallout, before the yeah, before the world ended. <laughs> yeah. Or, but I I think maybe maybe before that it was like 2008. I remember seeing you in New York at the Pedal Expo thing. Oh yeah, that's right. That might be one of the last times but yeah cool. uh man congratulations on the new album thank you uh i was just actually finishing my first listen through it this morning oh really and, yeah um uh, i think it was monica i think she sent that over for me oh cool cool yeah. yeah congratulations on that um of course the the name is perfect uh, <laughs> it's like yeah we uh we just can't help but troll our listeners <laughs> just it's just deep within us <laughs> i well i think that might be a part of the secret to your success too is that you don't you you make serious like intense music and very artistic music but you also don't seem to take yourselves too seriously and i think that that's a good mixture yeah i, I agree with you that's kind of that's exactly where we're coming from i think i think that it's like it's very easy to kind of fall into the depths of your own ass and uh you don't wanna, <laughs> we don't want to be up there <laughs> oh man yeah well i mean and it's been it's like the perfect like i said it's the perfect album title just in a lot of ways because you have you guys you guys came in right as as gent became a thing in a lot of ways i mean uh, and i don't know it's been like well over a decade when did you guys pop off that first album uh, the first album came out in 2010, and um, prior to that, we had like two other versions of that album with uh, very like different songs and like different uh, like versions of the production. But that was like the first, the first version of the uh, or the first like released version. So that's really the only one people could hear. But yeah, I mean, it was Gent was already a thing like even before that album came out. So. Yeah, definitely. I guess, uh, but maybe with the rise of periphery and animals and stuff, I feel like it got popularized, like officially uh, to me. I don't. I'm trying to think. Yeah, of who... I, I, I can, I can get behind that. I mean, like, um, we started doing a lot of touring then, and so did animals. And then you had monuments and tesseract and um, chimp spanner, and and mm. it, there's a bunch I'm missing, and I apologize uh, if I miss some, but there's a lot. And like, even by 2010, we've all been doing it for years. So, um, you know, That's thanks, Mashuga. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And, and we got, uh, we can always refer back to Heavy Devi's lyrics. Everybody loves to rip off Mashuga. Yeah, it's yeah. true. And 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 we also love to rip off. Devin, so <laughs> <laughs> hey man thanks like, Devin. yeah thanks dev <laughs> <laughs> yeah well that dude uh it's i was yes yeah, thinking about that too it's like 
it's uh when I when I listen, especially like guys like you guys that were I really I really uh praise the first the first album was such it felt like a landmark thing. And still to this day, when I go back and listen to that album, I'm like, oh, these guys really killed it on this. And you know, every every album has been kind of a bit of a one up on some level. Like you guys have always went wider, taller, you know, in some direction like that, that double album, the cool, I mean, clear was really cool. All those all the things you guys have been up to through the years and you always invited in other amazing guests you know i mean i think i found out about guthrie through you guys oh cool that that album you know um so yeah that's cool yeah i mean it's kind of like one of the uh perks of being in this style of music is that you always kind of run into the best musicians and it's you know i can't even express how lucky that makes me feel because like you know, I know where I'm at as a guitar player. I know how the other guys feel about their own playing. And like, we, you know, we definitely have like, we're not worthy syndrome. And it's, uh, it's just so cool that like, we have that kind of immortalized on a periphery record, you know, a Guthrie solo and a West solo and a John Petrucci solo. (laughs) And on periphery one, we had Jeff Loomis and stuff. It's just like, um, there is, there is, there is a downside to that is that like one of us has to learn like stuff we can't play. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well so at, t- speak to that because like who who i don't i haven't seen you guys live in a long time we haven't talked like what the, the who does the guthrie solo when or petrucci solo when that comes up is that you or who What's um so i tend to do most of the guest solos like i did the jeff loomis one poorly and i did the wes one poorly and uh <laughs> you know i did i made it kind of my own but um uh mark will do the have a blast that's the guthrie solo Mm. and the intention uh for the john petrucci solo was for mark to play it um but we never ended up playing uh, that song's called erised and we never we never ended up playing that one but i remember like when we were on tour with dream theater um mark uh asked john if he could like film videos of the the licks that he was playing so um But yeah, that was a long time ago. So I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I we've, I, I'm, I don't know if anybody's noticed or not, but we stopped having guests on our records just because it's just like, oh my God, I got to stress out about like pretending to be Guthrie Govan on stage. And it's just like, mm. it's, it's terrifying. Well, maybe, maybe you need to take a, a, a cue from Dev on that one. Cause when he had all those guests like on deconstruction, like he had Isan and a few, he just had them record their parts. And then there was a big, you know, in the visuals, they, when that, when their part comes up, they're just on the screen and it's piped in, you know? I mean, uh, yeah, that's, that's what we should do. (laughs) We uh, say Petrucci, go back and rip it up for us. And then like, we'll just (laughs) pipe you in when it's your turn. You know, I, I saw the Gorillas a long time ago, and they have guests on like all their songs, like huge names. And I was very curious. This is many years ago, it's so, like probably over a decade. And I was like, when I was on my way to the show, I'm like, I wonder how they're gonna like handle that, you know? And mm. uh, for they actually had some like some of the guests like perform the show with them, so I didn't know if they were on tour with them. But like for like in Snoop Dogg's case. They just put a big like video of Snoop Dogg like doing his performance, and it was kind of like, oh, that's clever. Um, so yeah, and that's actually who I I was I was gonna say like why, I mean, if you're gonna have a guest on this album, I mean, I was kind of hoping that it would be Snoop Dogg. I was like, <laughs> he's on <laughs> everything Snoop else. Dogg's into gen. He seems like he might be into gen because it's like you know he's a hip hop dude. Hip hop dudes are all about groove. We're all about groove. Come on, mm-hmm, Snoop, mm-hmm. hit me up. I think he could drop a, you know, drop a verse, some, some bars on, yeah. on periphery. Just do a, fire. Yeah. Special <laughs> single just with him. You got to write it with him in mind. And then, <laughs> you know, I know a guy that knows a guy, so I'm going to help you guys. No problem. Oh, shoot. Yeah. yeah. Let's my do buddy, it. my buddy, Ricky has been taking care of his, one of his studios for years. And that's the whole reason. I mean, I have, I got to smoke with Snoop twice, bro. And so like, <laughs> that's an honor, every, man. everybody's like, wait, what? you did yeah. I, well, yeah 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 it's weird i mean but this guy ricky like he's you know i'm actually prayers out to ricky right now he's been going through a lot of surgeries and heart issues and stuff so he's like hanging on by a thread but uh sorry to hear that yeah no same same man i mean he's like he's just it's a it's a longer story than we probably even have time here for but uh wonderful dude and uh he's really into metal 
and all the hip hop stuff and just happened to work for Snoop. And so like, if there was a thing, I would send it to him and he'd be like, Hey boss, <laughs> check oh, it out. Man. What you I'll, need to do. I'll, I'll, I'll see if, I'll see if the guys want Snoop on a record. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if Ozzy Osbourne and what's his name? Um, Post Malone can do something. You got a good point. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> let's not let's not like shut it down too too soon you know um no. well what's uh i'm curious i mean i know that you still got a few days here before the album drops right like we're a little bit later this month and yeah. uh you guys are getting ramped up probably going to drop some more singles and stuff before too long i know i think there's one of them out right uh we have um we've two. just released our third single and um that's going to be the final one before the album comes out and I think we're going to push like one more the day the album drops, but I'm not sure which one it is yet. Um, and uh, yeah, so that drops on March 10th. And um, man, it's it's been a long, long journey with this one. Usually they're not this hard. So I'm just happy that it's getting out. Mm. And, and the response to the singles has been good. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be like a catharsis once it's finally out and in, in people's hands. That's awesome. Uh, what, if you don't mind me asking, what was the difficulty in this one as opposed to other albums? Where where did the challenge lie mostly? Oh yeah, sure. Um, I guess you know the first thing was kind of figuring out when and where are we going to do this because this was pretty much like we started talking about the follow up to Periphery for maybe six months after COVID was in full swing. Mm. So we didn't know, like, you know, how do we handle the flying and the travel and like uh, the vaccine just started coming out. And uh, so we all had to, like, make sure that we were all vaccinated. It was just like that was like the first obstacle. And then early on, we decided we were going to do a concept record and um, we wrote a whole concept and we we wanted to do kind of like um something in the universe of our previous concept record where they're like not necessarily the stories aren't related but they kind of like take place in the same sort of universe just in a different time period um and then we kind of got pretty far through that and we ended up scrapping it and scrapping the idea but we also had like so many ideas that we loved and we didn't want to abandon so people are a little confused by the fact that we left motifs that we used in the juggernaut records in the songs, but they really, they really work. And we're just like, yeah, just leave it. It's fine. Like people will understand. And, you know, the callbacks are still effective. Like people who really like juggernaut get really excited when they hear the, the, um, these, uh, these motifs return. Um, so once, once we abandoned the concept record idea, then we had to, kind of figure out all right what do we need to like go back and take a second look at these songs and we did we ended up scrapping a bunch of songs and retooling ones that we thought had a lot of potential and uh that really took a bit of time because we all had our turn behind the producer's chair essentially where like you know pe different people had different issues with different songs so really it was kind of like up to them to kind of lead the lead the charge and mm -hmm. uh make it so they like the song and that we all like the song usually in the past it's been really easy to get everybody on the same page with songs especially on periphery three and periphery four the writing went so smoothly and it was just very effortless whereas this we knew that we were following up a record that we were all incredibly proud of and we knew we couldn't put anything out that not everybody in the band was behind so we just decided to, you know, even though it stinks to like kind of delay things, which is what we did, uh, you know, I think we, the record was better off for it. I think the songs are better for it and we can all live with ourselves. Mm. But yeah, well, that's, that's super important, right? When you're working in a democratic scenario there, like, it sounds like it's, uh, I wonder, I wonder how much, uh, it, it, well, let me back up first. I think it's really cool. That you bring back the motifs from juggernaut right i think that's something that not maybe enough bands even are willing to entertain because they feel like they have to have something new every time and to have a little bit of flavor come back like i mean it's something that 
that bands that more prog bands do you know like it's a dream theater like oh metropolis part two you that's know? kind like, of where we get it from is 100 percent dream theater and it, yeah i think what you're describing is like this sense of familiarity and it's not like like we brought back these sections and they're just like the you know copy paste of the session the the sections they're 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 the the motif is there, but the interpretation is different. So like, you know, you're getting a different rhythm or you're getting a major version instead of a, the original minor version and vice versa, mm. that kind of stuff. So like, we'd never just like kind of, you know, bring something back just to be like, look, nostalgia, like we're going to play with it a little bit and make it, you know, interesting. Yeah, that's great. That, I mean, but I, I, if there's one person, if there's one source you get to rip off for the rest of your life, it's you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, like if, yeah. Yeah. It was just like the, the, the mileage you can get out of your riffs, as long as you kind of have an imagination about them, you know, it's pretty much limitless. I think that's kind of like one of the things I find interesting about music is that there's not that many notes, but you <laughs> can create all of these like permutations and uh, vibes and, um, you know, kind of playing with harmony and counterpoint and all these things that can really make something that is, you know, you're either ascending or descending in a scale, that's it. And, you know, you, you, I think that's what's kind of interesting about it because you can make these really like huge, dense soundscapes, but they're really not, the the core components aren't that, you know, diverse. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Uh, thankfully, you know, the instrumentation and the, the nature of, the guitar and everything like there's and the effects and the different layers you you can just go forever obviously we're we're at a point point now where modern music has you know just hundreds of years worth of uh versions of the 12 note scale you know or yeah. the, you know the 12 note you know the, the the western scale so um you know just so many different ways of expressing yourself with the same similar tools yeah, yeah, it's cool. I, and, you know, I think that's why the whole uh, playing with the motifs thing works, because, you know, as long as you're as long as you have an imagination and you have, you know, you know how to use the tools at your disposal, which in our case are like synths and guitars and pedals and amps and stuff. And, uh, you know, you can kind of paint different pictures with it. Mm. Yeah, again, we're ref uh, I'll reference Devin again, because uh, he actually now that I think about it, he's one of the few guys that I've seen re-record an old song and put it on a new album with a different flavor a few different times. Like uh, when he put out Addicted, Hyperdrive was an, uh, a Ziltoid song. And then, but it's way, to me, it's way better with Annika on Addicted with the the better production and everything too. So it was like, he took it up a notch. I mean, I would still go back and listen to the original and it feels cool, but you know, he's yeah. able to express himself in a different way. I mean, he's done that a few times. Devin's kind of an outlier in that sense because and he's probably like the perfect example of somebody who can like really see all sides of his output and kind of craft it into new things and and kind of you know I don't think I know I can think of anyone else who just it can weave in and out of his own style and other styles and still have this kind of massive personality and this massive sound. Like he's really one of a kind, like, like, you know, probably one of the best to ever do it in my opinion. Amen, man. I agree a hundred percent. Yeah. So, I mean, well, in, in listening to this new to periphery five, uh, there's a considerable, I mean, I don't know, not, I think I only counted like one or two songs that didn't end in a really interesting compositional, like orchestrated, orchestrated way. Um, can you talk about how that came about? Is that something, because in the credits, it shows Misha is like doing a lot of that type of work, it sounds like. Is that kind of his, part of yeah, his major yeah. element on this album or? Yeah, so the the kind of, the orchestral sort of, additions at the end of the songs came way late in the process because we had the track list almost finalized and um we kind of talked about uh because in uh, we tend to have these sort of uh interludes or palette cleansers or whatever you want to call them kind of bolted onto the ends of these songs to kind of make the flow into the next track a fresh feeling because you know when you're getting a lot of the same sort of dynamic you know, you kind of need things, and at least in, our, in my opinion, need things to kind of uh, um, 
cleanse the palate and and kind of get you ready for the next thing. And uh, we were having internal discussions about, do we want interludes on this? And, you know, I think originally we we're kind of like, nah, let's just make it like, you know, you know, everything is its own song and its own world and everything. And then Misha started like sending over these orchestral things that he, he had been working on. He's like, what do you guys think about this and the end of this? And I'm like, that's actually awesome. So then we kind of like totally backpedaled on that idea. And uh, Misha, uh, you know, is largely responsible for a lot of the orchestral things. Uh, even within the songs, he is. So like a good example is um, there's a track, uh, Wax Wings. And um, I wrote that whole ending section. And it was like based on that main melody. And I tracked it. And then I was like, dude, you know what you should do? You should like do orchestral stuff here. And, I, and so he sat down mm. and like, he just kind of made the section so much better because it's like this huge buildup into this huge sort of, you know, epic outro. And um, that's a lot, you know, that a lot of times that's how these sections get built up is because, you know, he kind of gets, he just, he's so in tune with the, uh, uh, just classic instruments and just the sound of orchestral music that, you know, he can really like turn a section that's just into, that's just guitar into something much, much greater. And uh, he's done that for quite a few songs in our catalog. Mm, that's so cool, man. I, I agree. And that's something that I, I have noticed that you guys definitely pay attention to. You give attention to the palate cleanser. And I love that you use that term because that's exactly how I felt this morning, listening to this album. And as after the first few songs were, uh, going by I was like oh I like that there's this theme kind of it's like not a it's not a, th a musical theme but it's like a reoccurring uh, freshness to each track so when the next one comes in I feel like I, I get to start over again you get to build it you get to slay it in any all these different ways and then there's something that lets you kind of uh, off that high end uh, you know, that high energy into something a little bit cleaner a little more spacious yeah, that's a, that's a hundred percent the idea, and uh, I appreciate I appreciate records that give the listener some space um, because, mm. especially with a, a genre like metal or gen or anything, any of its like uh, you know related sounds, it can get really fatiguing on the ear. And um, you know, I I hope that this gives sort of people you know the set like the ability to kind of come down off of the sort of assault on the ears and, and, you know, move on to the next piece kind of fresh. Mm. Yeah. And, and, I, and noticeably, I, you know, you guys have always had a sense, uh, like a, a sense or a thread of pop sensibility in the midst of your gent, like prog, like insane, you know, time signature thing. And it seems like there may even be a stronger thread this time around. And I don't know, is that like a Spencer thing when on the vocals, there's some of the, some of the, the, the palate cleanse actually happens in some of these other sections that come through. I'm curious about how that come about on this particular album. Yeah. Um, I think all of us kind of have, uh, you know, a, we all have an affinity for pop music. Uh, it's tough to call anything in, anything close to what we do like poppy but there is that sort of um there is that sensibility in some sections uh, and uh i think i think a large majority of it comes from spencer and and the music that he likes to listen to and just his vocal style um and uh a good example of that is uh the track Sil silhouette which um uh, me and misha wrote that as kind of like this sort of electronic song that was just an electronic song it was supposed to be kind of like we have a project together me and misha that's like just like that sound and um spencer we sat down with spencer and we we're like all right we want you to write vocals for this like what what does it what does the song need and so me and spencer kind of spent a whole day just adding sections and kind of building up into what the song eventually became which is sort of like a synth wave sort of synth pop song um and uh yeah it's just kind of uh we all love that style and we try to figure out 
clever ways to incorporate it into this kind of uh, heavy metal world, which um, some people like and some people don't. But, you know, I, I feel like like on our last album, we had a song called Crush, which really wasn't very heavy. And it was a pretty polarizing song. And mm. um, and we had a song on Periphery 3 called Catch Fire, which is like very, very like not poppy but just kind of not what we normally do and and i think that was a polarizing song and for me those are some of my most favorite moments because you know i'm used to the metal thing you know i have it like pretty much drilled into my head when i go on tour and you know i i, I do listen to metal and it's just kind of like it's refreshing to kind of uh see see what else we're capable of musically because it's like it's almost like it's almost like eating the same food every day. It's like eventually you're going to kind of get like bored of it and you want to see what other food is out there. So that's kind mm. of the way that I look at it musically. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, there's, it's so, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, uh, you know, it's it's very, uh, it's, it's a, a large task to take on to put all these elements into one album or even, you know, just to have them present in one band and everybody kind of feel good, A, you know, get their part in that they like and and then everybody feel good about all the songs. I'm really impressed with uh, with just that element alone that you guys even agree at the end of the day. Oh, yeah, this is the thing, right? You're like, we love it. <laughs> that's something we had to cultivate and I'm glad you brought that up because um, that's uh, it's one of the kind of reasons I feel so lucky to be with this group of guys is they all contribute immensely to the sound like without one of them you know this band really wouldn't be the same any one of them and uh they also know when to kind of at least I know when to kind of like take a step back and just like I hear somebody doing their thing and I don't need to get involved like they got it handled and I I like that I like that attitude because I'd say all the guys have that and it really enables people to kind of flex their muscles musically and not have somebody interfering or always playing the producer role because we all trust each other to be in that role. So, you know, we'll all be honest with each other if somebody's doing something musically that we're not into, but a lot of times you, as long as you're like supportive and you just like let people do their thing in this band it, like something great really come usually comes out of it so it's like it's a very fortunate position to be in because i know a lot of bands you know they have one or two principal songwriters and then everybody else is kind of like they track their parts and that's about it and uh, there's just so much creativity to go around that it's kind of we with when it comes to material we get option paralysis of like trying to pick the best stuff and uh you know, with that said, it's not that we don't run into the, the like, like I said earlier in the, the conversation, there were tracks that some people were feeling and some people weren't. So we kind of have to go back and take uh, more, uh, more care with them. So we get everybody on the same page and everybody likes it. And the fact that we can do that is special. Yeah, it is. I mean, just, just to, two friends trying to agree on certain <laughs> things sometimes is a lot, you know, and then you get five people, you know, uh, that's, that's a whole nother thing. And you have three guitar players. Like, I don't, I still don't even understand. You know, I, I was like the early days trying to be in a band, trying to find one other guitar player that <laughs> I, that we could like be, you know, in the same zone, same mindset around and let alone like you guys just really lucked out in a lot in a big way. 100%. Uh, and it's personality uh, the biggest the biggest thing is personality and um that's something that was like developed too like i didn't come into this band like fitting in perfectly like i i've mm. used to butt head with butt heads with misha uh quite often um and uh it was uh it, it took a it took a long time for us to kind of like me, me and misha have always been like musically compatible um and i've always been musically compatible with mark and and the rest of the guys too um but it's it's also something that, like communication is something we had to work on i know it's like kind of like a cliche thing people say it's like oh it's always about communication well it truly is because if you don't learn how to respectfully communicate to your your you know your collaborators uh, people are going to get like resentful or or bitter and um you know, there were times where I was like feeling like, 
man, like a lot of my stuff isn't making the cut. Like, am I shot? And uh, mm -hmm. it, it took me a while to like kind of understand that uh, I just had to be, you know, I just had to practice more. I just had to be more persistent. I just had to like change things. Everything was in here. I just had to fine tune it. So, you know, I got what I wanted. And I also like was able to communicate with my band better. And it, like once I kind of like figured out that it wasn't like, it was like, it wasn't anything that I was really doing. It was just more of like my mindset. And once I learned to kind of like take the ego out of it and like not worry about just serve the song, I became more comfortable. And I think everybody kind of like reached that point at different points in the career of the band. And it's just, it's just nice because a lot of times, you know, if people are feeling kind of like, oh man, all the stuff I'm doing is getting cut. Then they kind of get like, why am I even in this band? Right. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's never a good place. So um, it took a long time to get there, but now it's just, uh, just so great. It's so great. And, you know, there were difficulties writing this record and I kind of like at once we finished and it, you know, we do like a weekly band call. I was like, Hey guys, I want you guys to remember something. Like we went through something that was really, really hard and we came out the other end and you know, we did it. So like, if we can solve, I want you guys to remember this moment. Cause if we can solve that problem, then when it comes again, let's not get discouraged. Like we did, you mm. know? And uh, yeah, so it's good. I got, I got a great group of guys. Yeah. It, it sounds like, you know, at this point, that each of you have learned to trust the organism that is the greater thing, you know, the, the, the group of you to trust kind of the, the intuition of, of the organism of the group, you know, and like you said earlier, you're like, Oh, well, I hear somebody else doing their thing and they got to work through it and, and find their place. Then it's like, you're not, you don't feel as concerned. And, you know, I'm sure in the beginning in the early years, I mean, in a lot of other groups that I've been in and around, like there's, there tends to be a, a proving season and you feel like, well, if I better prove myself here uh, in all these ways, and if my stuff gets cut, then I'm not available or I'm not as, as worthy of the spot, whatever. But like over time, the communication sounds like that leveled things out and here you are. So Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's, that's exactly what I was, uh, was getting at. It's like, uh, you know, when you, you kind of feel uh, it, inferior inferior it's like an inferiority complex in a sense but like now that like enough years have gone by like there's so much of my material on these records it's just kind of like you know i work i put in the work i you know i fixed things within my personality that made me easy to work with and everybody else did the same sort of like self-work and mm. it's just it's just really nice and what there's something else that you said that i really agree with like periphery kind of being its own sort of organism or it's it's like it's kind of this thing that we kind of orbit around um and it's funny that we're called periphery but it's <laughs> it is true it's kind of like you know we all understand that the band is kind of like this thing that's greater than ourselves and it we see it as this kind of vehicle to kind of bring our musical dreams to to reality and um I think everybody appreciates it too. There's, there's an appreciation for the fact that the band is sort of this thing that we can count on um, for a career, but also to be fulfilled artistically. Mm. And I'd, I'd be interested to know, I mean, cause you kind of, you touched on it here with there being difficulty in this album cycle and creation, right? Just trying to find the middle ground for everybody but I, I, you know, I wonder about you guys have been doing it so long now, like we're talking, you know, I don't know, 15 years or something like 10. Yeah, at least that sounds a, about right. It's well, 50, over a decade. Years, but yeah. yeah. And and, you know, I in that time, even when things are going good, you know, things you, like I, per, I speak personally, like from my own career, like my life has been great and I'm super thankful for all the things right but there's been multiple points along the ro road where i was like oh shit am i even doing the right thing like i should maybe i need to be doing something else is this is am i gonna just burn out on this you know because i you know you have to find a way to freshen it up and i i wonder about yourself like uh you know either personally or professionally with the band like ha have there been how did you get through those moments as they arose you know as on a personal level was it do you do any therapy? Do you, do you, do you work it out? Like by going to the gym or like, what's your process? 
Yeah, um, it's it. I could say that like there there were stretches of time in in my in my existence in this band where I was just like, man, like I eat, sleep, and breathe this band. I I feel like this is gonna burn me out if I don't kind of like reclaim a little bit of my identity. And um, I think a little bit was like kind of distancing myself from the online portion of being in a band and just constantly like just checking everything out like it's un it's completely unnecessary for me at this stage and i think that kind of gave me a little bit of myself back um as far as like things that i need to do that are outside of music it's like a lot of hiking um i do go to the gym um i also uh like do a lot of gaming and and hanging out with buddies that are into like cars and 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 stuff like that so it's kind of like that's my outlet and um I, and musically i also have a, a solo project that kind of allows me to like do whatever i want and for better or for worse like not having a collaborator you can kind of just like put things out there and that's you know that it it's good enough you know whereas mm -hmm. like i couldn't I don't think I could do a, like a, a a periphery sounding band on my own. Like that's that's solely this thing that I have with these guys. And for me, it's like the the music that I put out solo is so much different. And I like that because it's kind of like this other side of my personality musically. And um, I need to do that too. So yeah, it's it's very easy to get burnt out, especially when like you're, you know you wake up and it's like, okay, what's periphery going to do today rather than what's Jake going to do today? Mm. You know? Yes. I can see, uh, especially with, with the ongoing success of the band that, that it, the, the pull to immerse yourself constantly in the business, in the projection of where and what the band is going to do, what next, you know, that in a lot of ways it, it has to come first in a lot of ways because it's probably it's the thing that's bringing in the cash it's the thing that's you know that that brings in future success you kind of like you're hanging everybody's hanging their hat on this thing that they're collaborating on so um and i i, I can you know personally relate to a degree at different times working for different brands uh when i was doing emg tv thing man i mean it was a lot of work to like hustle artists into this northern california studio that's not close to anything you know, and try to book all the hotels and make sure everybody's eating and everybody, you know, it's like, it's like a mini Nam event, you know, uh, yeah. and, uh, and you can get lost and like, I'm like, oh my gosh, I haven't even done my regular work. I'm just doing the the big special project right now. I've got all this legwork that I still have to do. And yeah, you know, and I'm like, oh, maybe I should take a weekend or a week off and like do things that Chris wants to do, go to the beach, yeah. you know, walk the dog, this type of stuff. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good point. And I think that kind of like, that shines a, a light on um, people who are now like, they fancy themselves as content creators for social media or YouTube or Twitch or, or whatever. And I'm seeing at the rate at which people are churning out their content. And some people find success doing it. But I think like, it looks a certain way to somebody who might be interested in doing that, then they get into it and then they realize, Oh wait, like this is just like being in a band except you're by yourself and you have to do everything yourself. And I see quite a few people who just get kind of burnt out on it. Like I've tried to give the Twitch thing a, 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 a try. And every time I, I like think I'm like, all right, this time I'm going to do it. I'm going to get going. <laughs> something happens in my life where I'm just like, I don't have time for this, <laughs> you know? So mm, like mm. it's um, it requires a huge upfront investment and a continuous investment. It's all about consistency to build your audience. And then sometimes it just doesn't work, you know? And yep. sometimes you just don't have the personality or the time invested or the right message or branding or whatever. And it's just, it seems pretty exhausting. So it's uh it's yes. a, we're in a tough spot right now, uh, kind of socially when, and like, especially people trying to figure out like what they want to do, what, you know, cause I, people want to get into the field that they're passionate about, but sometimes access is, uh, it comes at too, too steep of co a cost. Yeah. I think you, I think you actually hit it. It's like people think they want 
to do the thing they because like oh i love guitar and i want to play guitar for everybody or i like making videos about gear i'm going to review gear and i'm you know and they think they want it until they ha until the rubber hits the road and they're like you realize oh wait that are these pe other people out there actually spending their entire day for one freaking 15 second video or 30 second video to like be yeah. just right yeah, actually, they did for a long time. They, their process may be a lot quicker now. You know, I mean, I look at somebody like uh, Thomas McRocklin, you know, like who is a content king. Like, I mean, he but his world revolves around it. He He's not on tour 99% of the time. He's usually at home in the studio. He's not he doesn't have the same, you know, uh, stuff that you have to think about around the big world tour thing. He, you know, it's. It's, but it's the same as being in a band. It's the same, maybe even more in some respects, because he's doing most of it himself. And yeah, I think a lot of people, you know, ha wake up to that when they get even three steps into it. And they're like, oh, wait a second. Yeah. Even just having a simple podcast. Did you, do you have your logo figured out? Do you have your thing figured out? Do you have what, like, it's a lot. It's, it's a, a lot. lot. And, and um, I also know that people are good at maintaining kind of like after they achieve some success they're good at maintaining the diy look of their you know whatever it is that they're working on but a lot of times behind the scenes they have multiple people mm. helping them now and people see kind of like the end result of this many years of working starting off solo then slowly maybe becoming successful enough to hire a producer or an assistant or a camera operator or somebody who can like organize your your workflow and stuff like that and a lot of a lot of like the most successful channels and um social media accounts will have more than one person behind them even though it, they started out as one person and they still look like one person it's not mm. necessarily one person good point good point yeah i'm sure i'm sure thomas and all it's like it's kind of the the look of what you know, you look at Joe Rogan or any big podcast or any big thing and you're like, yeah, it still kind of looks like it's just two couple dudes in the thing. But like, you know, for sure, like at, at that level, there's five to 10 people making sure it all goes right. You know? Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. 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 It makes sense. Uh, yeah. It's, you know, it's one of those things uh, I, 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 people ask all the time, like, well, how do I get this? You know, and I'm sure you get it all the time. Well, how, what's, what would you tell somebody that's trying to get into the, feel that you're in and you're like oh man it's like such a loaded question like yeah you know it's you like, might not be good at any of the things that you think you're good at and that you have to wake up to that before you can actually yeah, get anywhere. I, i've had to wake up to that quite a few times <laughs> um it's same, uh, same it's a uh, it's a tough question to answer like sincerely because it's like i want to just be a, i just want to like grab them by their shoulders and I'll be like, it's pure luck. <laughs> um, and uh, because it's like, I'm, I don't think I'm like not talented. I, I do know that I possess a degree of talent, but because I always think about like, well, if that didn't happen, then this wouldn't have happened. And if I didn't meet that person, then this other person wouldn't have come into my life. And then I wouldn't have paid attention to what they're doing. And then that brought skills to me that I didn't even know that I needed. And then it's like, I'm like trying to draw this map in my head. And then I'm just like, wow, it really does come. Like you have to be there and you have to be accepting of opportunity as you see it kind of unfold. And, you know, it's just kind of an impossible question to like truthfully and methodically answer for someone. So it's like, usually when somebody asks me that, like, how do I, you know, start a band or how do I get on tour? And I'm just like, just show up on time, make good friends and show mm. up on time. It's mm. like the best thing you can do. Mm, that, that is really good, simple advice to the point, right? Because um, nobody wants to wait for your ass. And yeah, uh, <laughs> like, yeah, and, and like it, if you're on time, if you if you're early, you're on time, and if you're on time, you're late. I think that's like a like not a, a jazz thing. Yeah, yeah. it's like a, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that I I I agree with that. It's funny because. I think one of the first things that Devin said to me when we first started working together, uh, he was one of my first kind of like exciting, like personal hero people that I worked with. When I got the gig at uh, Ampeg and Mackie, we also did Alvarez guitars. And he was like, his his buddy Mark called me and was like, hey man, Mark, uh, do you know who Devin is? I'm like, oh yeah, I know who Devin is. Like, <laughs> he's like, well, he's, he needs an acoustic guitar. 
you know, to finish this album called Ghost that he's going to release soon. And I was like, oh, well, anything I can do, I'll I'll do it. And he's like, well, he wants to drive down and hang out with you. I'm like, oh, shit. You know, it's like <laughs> he came down and, and spent the night and hung out. And um, I remember in that first session, he was just like, he's like, look, man, I've I've been doing this a long time. And this is, you know, I don't know, 15 years ago or something. And he's like, I've been doing this a long time. And, you know, uh, I've dealt with a lot of AR guys and I'm just going to give you the straight scoop that like, Hey, if you can't do something, tell me right away that you can't do it. Cause the world is full of people saying, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Sure. Yeah. No problem. And then I'm stuck waiting around and I hate, he's like, it's the time. It's a timely thing. It's a timely. Cause if you drag something out, you're essentially, you know, if you might have a good reason to do it and that's fine. If you're communicative around it, great. You know, everybody knows, oh, it's good. It's delayed. It's delayed. It's delayed. But if you keep saying, oh, man, any minute now, you know, and then there's like actually nothing going yeah. on. Oh, man. What yeah, a horrible I, I, I respect I respect that kind of thing, because like when it comes to like promises that people in the industry will make, it's like it's almost like in their head, they're very confident in their own abilities. And they're like, oh, I'll just figure it out. Like, I got to get this guy on the roster. Or I got to work with this person. And um, it's uh you know, it's always uh, over promise and under deliver. And I, that can be really frustrating, especially for someone like Devin, who has been doing this for a really long, long time. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he probably appreciates just more uh, uh, matter of fact, sort of honesty about stuff. And, you know, we all do too. It's just like, look, like we, I'm not going to be mad at you if you can't help. It's just, you know, just let us know if you can't. So that way we can figure out you know, because like you said, mm. it is there. Everything, uh, everything with music is all about timing. <laughs> Go figure. Yeah, um, yeah. It was uh, an interesting thing because you know there's a dynamic, especially. And I was, I was, I'm still, I'm as I could, as you can tell, I'm still so thankful for Devin for saying that for being matter of fact in the very beginning. He caught me it, within the first six months of me doing this gig, you know, and and was like, hey, I'm gonna just say, hey, like this is you don't know everybody in the industry yet, you know, and you're going to like, I'm just gonna say you're going to be miles ahead. If you just do this one thing, if you're going to do it, great, do it. If you can't do it, great. Tell me I can't do it. Tell yeah. the person you can't do it right away. And so that, and I was like, Oh, that's great. Because uh, it helped really help. It helped a, a lot of things. Uh, and one of them being that Devin, cause I, I, you know, I, I saw him and I was like, Oh, I got stars in my eyes a little bit. Cause I remember, when the Steve Vai album dropped, like I was watching Headbangers Ball, and there was this, you know, fruitcake with the weird braid on the bald head and running around. On, I was like, I don't know what Vai's up to, but he's got a crazy cool singer, and let's go. It's the '90s still. Like I'm interested, you know. Yeah. And um, so I re I remember that, and then I remember getting turned on to Ocean Machine and just being like, Who is who is this guy with this voice? Like, yeah there's nobody's got this voice this is something else you know and and it was a new production style too it was like kind of this blend of like industrial meets metal and, and it was just like that kind of like huge sound like the only other band really doing it at the time was uh maybe Meshuga and fear factory and but like Dev, Devin like had like that that more prog approach and i loved it yeah and he's and he's got the genuine like I, no no i mean obviously fred you know the Meshuggah guys and the Fear Factory guys, cool, but but De Dev's got that like front person vocal ability, you know, that yeah. he doesn't have to hold a guitar and could do all the things. And but then he picks up a guitar and does it all at the same time and wrote the whole yeah. fucking thing. You, you, know? Know, you know what kind of bugs me about Devin and people who like Devin is that I don't think they realize exactly how ridiculous a guitar player he is. Like mm -hmm. he's like he's an insane guitar player, and it's just I wish more people would kind of. I know a lot of people do. I'm not like trying to say he's like underrated. He's not, but like it's just you know he 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 is a guitar player, and he's a hell of a player. And mm. uh, it would be cool if he kind of like got more uh, recognition for it. Yeah, I, th I agree with you. I think he I think he will, and you know, in 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 the near future for a whole host of reasons, but. Uh, I will say, yeah, I've learned so much. I mean, I was, you know, we did the guitar, the acoustic guitar together and he invited me to London. I played second guitar to him in London at the, uh, 
what you call it, uh, Union Chapel out in the UK and stuff. And in the process of trying to learn his super soft, hippie, dippy, spacious, big reverb, big, huge delay things where there's like huge like spots where you don't play, you know, and I hear I'm like trying to like learn the metals. I wish he I was like wishing that he would have like, no, man, I'll tap me for a metal set, you know, and I would have learned that that would have been more, you know, like in my wheelhouse kind of, but like he kind of, I think, you know, he knows what he's doing and he's like, no, 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 I, you need to learn the spacious stuff. Like I, and you helped me with this album. So you're going to play like this huge spacious sparse thing. And I just learned so much from being in the room with him and the rehearsals and like watching his hands almost, you know, and kind of listening to his breathing. And I know that's a weird thing, but like listening to how he would breathe and how he'd hold the instrument and, yeah. I was like, oh, I'm I'm in it's obvious I'm in the room with the master right now. Like I'm not and he he might be joking around it and telling you fart and poop jokes, but like <laughs> it's it's a real that's deal. Just a bonus like, of yeah, hanging that's... out with him. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> totally the to bonus. Do, he used to do these like huge like Photoshop collages of like we toured with him and this band Shining, and he he would like take pictures of us and like photoshop them all together and these like weird hilarious collages i'll never forget it it always used to make me laugh <laughs> how many times have you been face swapped with dev uh probably a few um uh, mostly the one that i think is the funniest one is uh you know dave it's guitar player dave yeah yeah we dave Young. had this we, yeah we had we had the same beard and we kind of look alike so we did oh, a yeah. swap and you couldn't <laughs> you couldn't tell <laughs> who's who it just looked the same. <laughs> that actually, I can totally envision that right yeah. now. Oh man, he, oh he sent me a, um, he said he sent me a face swap. He says, "Don't share this." <laughs> <laughs> he he did a face swap with Tosin, and he's and he showed it to Tosin, and it's it's <laughs> such a fucking train wreck. He's like, bro, he's like, delete that, delete that, and he's all he's all, I'm sending it to you because you and Tosin are friends and you can handle it, but like, don't show anybody. And it's so it's such a train wreck, and he's like he's like he goes he goes. He was a, you know, he's a, it's, it's totally cool. Cause for the first time, I actually feel like I'm cool. Like when he looks at the thing, he's all, but I feel so bad for toast. Like, yeah. Oh, it's a total train wreck. But, um, he makes me cry all the time. He sends me out of the blue. He'll send me something and I don't, I, I'm always scared to look at it. Cause like, it, <laughs> yeah, you don't know what you're going to get. It's, it could be as benign as like, Hey, look at this guitar, this piece of gear, or like, you know, whatever or just something horrendous that you'll never be able to seen. unsee yeah <laughs> yeah oh so uh, i'm like but give me a little bit of heads up if i you know i might be somewhere where it's not appropriate i don't know yeah I'm like online at the post office can't open, oh, can't open that up <laughs> dude yeah just throw, start throwing up over everybody uh yeah no he's wonderful um so we will we'll, we'll try not to make this podcast about devin that's okay. I would be totally <laughs> cool if it was. I love Devin. Well, that's cool too. Yeah. I yeah. mean, same. Um, but I am curious, uh, don't you have a, a, a kind of a, a fresh rendition of your new Ibanez guitar? Yeah. Yeah. I got it right here. Actually, love to see it and have you tell um, us about it. Yeah. Uh, so this is uh, the JBM. Mm. The that JBM color. quadruple nine. Cool. Yeah. And um, it's got this uh, azure metallic matte blue finish, and um, it's got new signature Demarzio pickups in it. So, like, I originally had the Demarzio Titan, and these are the Demarzio Mirage. They haven't technically been announced yet, but I've already been kind of talking about them just because I play the guitars, and people kind of saw that, like, I was playing a new pickup that had these, like, vents kind of punched yeah. into them. Yeah. Um, and uh yeah they uh they kind of made a, a proprietary bridge for me for this guitar it's 27 frets is that an ibanez but, bridge you said or is that somebody else making that bridge um it's an ibanez bridge okay uh, they may they, maybe gibraltar makes it and I, i'm not exactly sure but i know that they like tooled it for this this and you it, it serves like a more lower profile scenario for you or yeah, what's the, like what's the... it's basically the you know like uh it's it closely related to like the hip shot sort of mm. design because i like those bridges but 
I've been it looks flatter on the sides and it looks more comfortable to me. Yeah, it is very flat. Okay. Uh, and it's very, very comfy. Uh, and it sounds good too. It's a good sounding bridge. Um, five way pickup selector uh, and just a volume knob because I don't really mess with the tone knob that much. Um, has loom inlays for the side dots mm. um, for those dark stages. Um, painted neck. I know a lot of people don't like painted necks, but I love them. So they're just going to have to deal with it. Is it satin and, finish uh, though? What's that? Satin finish on the neck as well. Oh, yeah. 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 The whole the whole guitar. It's like kind of like a satin matte sort of like hybrid where it's like not too matte, but it's it's hmm. uh it's got a little bit of uh you can kind of see the gradient like on the neck. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's it's got a little bit of reflective quality to it. Um and what's the neck pickup there? The neck pickup is also a DeMarzio Mirage. It's a uh, it's a hot rails uh humbucking pickup, but I always love the look of like HS configuration guitars, kind of like the comparisons and uh, yeah. old ESPs of the day. Um, and uh, I thought it'd be cool to have a single coil slot. So in case you wanted to put a single coil in there, you totally could. But uh, you know, the, with the pickup selector, I can get single coil sounds. So you've uh, had them uh, do this new set in both full size and mini humbucker essentially and it's the same kind of attempt to have this, a similar sound it so i did not do a a full size humbucker for the neck like the neck is just going to be this um okay. yeah uh, that but the the titan is still available and uh i don't know if i have a oh wait i do so if you wanted a, a humbucking neck pickup I see. Or, or rather a, a full-size humbucker, I should say. Um, you can still get the Titan. And this is uh, these are my seven-string Titans. And these are still great, too. Just like, you know, after a while, you kind of want to see what other sounds you can get by working with uh, your uh, your pickup company. And then one other thing is uh, I had a LA Custom Shop Ooh. built that's kind of like a take on my original signature model. Oh, wow, sick. And uh, I have an Evertune bridge in here with like the gold saddles. That's and, hot. Um, I have stripes uh, on the pickups. What? Yeah. Yeah. So this is like I did a gold bobbin underneath the oh. cover. So like the window, you can see the gold bobbin underneath, and it kind of goes along with the whole black and gold aesthetic. Mm. Um, but kinda yeah, kill that. It's got gold rails too on the the neck pickup. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. Wow, Rails, Demarzio's uh, killing it, dude. Demarzio has always been great. Yeah, but like... yeah, that's they're they're my favorite pickup company. I, 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 they they hook it up, and then uh, I uh, did uh, black tuners, black hip shot tuners, like open back ones. Ooh, yeah, and yeah. Kind of see the the gears there, and then I took I cannibalized the uh, the nuts from a set of gold tuners and put them on the black ones so i have like kind of two-tone tuners there that came out great jake wow yeah. but the evertune the evertune is just like the best thing ever I, I can't get enough of that what do you keep that particular one what's the tuning for that one it's uh everything down a whole step with the low string a g oh, okay okay yeah that's badass man congratulations on all that like uh yeah. and ivan is one of the greatest uh companies to ever make a guitar of all time yeah. you know they got some of the dopest people throughout history uh playing ibanez and uh mike arigo man oh, i love mike mike is a big reason why these uh these guitars exist um yeah. you know he's always taking good care of me and you know they let me use their custom shop and it's just uh it's kind of a it's kind of cool yeah mike's the dude i've just always always loved that guy he, like it's always been you know, years before I ever was doing anything with any guitars or anything, he was, I was, uh, you know, a lot of it came about around, uh, around EMG and stuff and, and Don Lop, I guess I would, I would see him a lot in LA for different events and stuff, but just, just such a happy, positive guy that, that actually enjoys doing a good job at what he's, what he's hired to do. And yeah. I just so respect that, you know? Um, and then he, and he, and he, and 
it's proof when I talk to all the artists that he deals with, and they're like, "Oh, Mike," and I'm like, oh, "Yeah, good. yeah." yeah. He, he, he's he's easily one of my favorite parts about working with Ibanez because I know that like if I have a question or if I need a piece of gear or if I want to build a new guitar or anything, like he, you can tell that he's excited about it. Whereas like I feel I don't feel like I'm going to him like asking him for things i know that he's going to be like oh yeah let's do it you know like what can you know what do you need and he's just like the he gets excited to you know do what he does and yeah I, I, yeah i love him for it um let me just uh let me just text my uh um one of my uh management dudes because i i have uh, another interview after this one and i think it starts at three i just want to make sure that okay he no knows. check here sorry about this it's okay your east coast time yeah yeah interview oh wait it's at four cool okay we're good we're good no worries yeah. Well, yeah, the next uh, question, a line of question was about uh, kind of a little bit of what this whole podcast got predicated with. And that's uh, curious about guitar picks and your history with guitar picks. Like, uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about like where you started. Like, I, sometimes it's a little vague, you know, in your early years, like what was the first couple of guitar picks that you remember? Oh, I, I, I remember. I oh, totally, good. Yeah, yeah. And if there was anybody that influenced you along the way. And then, you know, how did you get to play what you're playing now? And then maybe you can show us that stuff too. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I probably still have some of the first guitar picks I ever owned. And this is wow. like going back to, I'm 39. This is going back to like when I was eight. So yeah. they're, they're around here somewhere. I just have to find like what, like kind of like uh, memories box I might've thrown them into. But <laughs> so my first pick ever was, um, or a couple of picks was, uh, those fender ones that were like multicolored. It looks like they were assembled from like different colors of plastic. It was like red and blue and black in there. And it had the like clown fender. vomit. Yeah, exactly. It kind of looked like that. Um, and I picked them because they looked cool. Like I didn't know anything about picks. I was just like, mm, the, the colorful one. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I would go to the music store and this is in the like the mid or late nineties, some somewhere in there. And I noticed this, this brand called tech pick and it was like the only metal picks there. And I'm like, Oh, I want to play a metal pick. That sounds cool. <laughs> and like, they were fine, but I feel like they like broke my strings. <laughs> um, and, uh, I also liked them because they had these like holes punched into them. And like, that was like back when I like wore a guitar pick uh, around my neck so I could let everyone know that I played the guitar. Yes, dude, <laughs> that's so awesome. Um, and, uh, and then um, I, I got turned on to the Jazz 3 as like pretty much every, the Dunlop Jazz 3, pretty much every metal guitar player, like prog guitar player goes through their Jazz 3 phase or is still there. Mm -hmm. And um, that was pretty much what I used just exclusively for many, like decades, pretty much. How did and, you find uh, it? Was there a Pertucci, a Pertucci thing? Yeah, or? it was. Yeah. Oh, okay. um, so I don't know if how many people know this. A lot of people do because I always get questions about it. But my uncle is John Pertucci. So I was always kind of exposed to the gear he was using, amps, guitars, you know, that mm. One my first Ibanez was one that him and uh, my aunt, his wife, gave to me. Uh, wow. I still have it. It's an RG five fifty. And uh, but one of the things that he kind of uh, showed me was like, you should play with these. And he showed me a Jazz three. And um, funny enough, I probably still have that original Jazz three. Um, Man, that's but so cool. This is uh, this is one of uh, my newer picks, but you can see it's in that kind of small Jazz three shape and i have like the gold foil with the periphery three dots on there and um i have my my signature i don't use these anymore because i, I opt for a more a bigger pick that has a little bit more give on it these are pretty um pretty heavy um but now I, this one's kind of messed up let me find one that doesn't look like uh Did you graduate up to the flow series or or more of a t3 yeah or... i think these are flows and i think that you got me turned on to these you gave me a bag probably of <laughs> and uh 
it was it was whatever the flow yeah that's the flow, flow shape right there yeah um and like they have a nice amount of give but if you choke up on them they get really firm so mm. like you can kind of get that sort of like heavy pick feel if you if you choke up on them but if you need something a little bit more you know with a little bit more give which in periphery with three guitar players when we're all playing that even that little bit of like give will improve the tuning stability of the string mm. so um now i use these which are it's more of like a it's like a jazz three shape but it's a bigger profile and uh yeah i got a couple of different versions here i have like the white version with the gold oh yeah and i got a yellow version with black this one this one i use the hell out of <laughs> you can that's tell awesome that. yeah like the um, other one and then i got one other thing Yeah, I, I don't know why I put these in a frame. It's kind of kind of narcissistic, but I, these are like the first like custom picks I ever had made for me. Um, and I remember those. I think I did those for you. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so I put them. Uh, I put them in this frame, and uh, yeah, it's kind of a little a uh, little bit of history here because this is from the first batch. Before that, I was just you know buying picks at the store. Love that man. That's I would you know, I have. Uh... I have a bunch of picks and frames around here. None of them are mine though, Jake. Um, so I'm not quite on, you know, uh, mine are just laying around the place, all over the place. That's amazing. So did you, I mean, how much did John play a role in your learning guitar then? A pretty, pretty big role. So they, you know, like I mentioned earlier, they, they were, him and his wife gave me my first Ibanez guitar and, um, I took I took a few lessons from him uh, in like '95, I think, mm. and I would go uh, I'd go to his house, and um, it was always a blast. Like it was always a lot of fun, and uh, we we couldn't really continue doing it just because he was touring a lot more. The band Dream Theater was getting bigger, and it was just uh, it was harder to kind of to get together. And then he eventually moved pretty far away from me, so then. I really only ever saw him on holidays at that point. Um, but as far as like the influence that he had, it's, it's immeasurable because uh, dream theater is one of my favorite bands. Like that album awake is probably one of my top three favorite albums of all time. Mm. And like, I'd say that's a big reason my playing sounds the way it does. Like maybe you know, maybe it's not like a direct sort of, you wouldn't be able to tell that that's where I've gotten a lot of my inspiration from, but I can assure anybody listening who knows that album, like there are a few people who know, know that album as well as I do. And mm -hmm. uh, I really owe a lot musically to that album. And, um, but yeah, also just kind of the way that he like does things, like the way that he kind of, you know, approaches playing and and he's just very like, methodical and he just takes his time with things and i don't know it's just it's very inspiring to watch um so yeah uh huge influence on me mm. do you do you remember anything in particular around the first couple lessons that you were able to take with him what any key points yeah um so that was the first time i ever saw like somebody sweeping like mm. on a guitar like i didn't know like it looked it it looked so impossibly fast to me that it kind of like it kind of like opened up this thing in my mind where I'm like, oh, you can play guitar like that. Like if you practice enough, you can play guitar like that. And um that was kind of, you know, I I still like can't do what he can do on the guitar, but you know, it that was probably the first time that I was like made aware of like really technical playing. Um and then the other thing is he taught me like a lot of the basics, like the C major scale, like I learned from him mm. and like the stuff that you learn when you first pick up the instrument, I learned from him. And, um, it's, uh, you know, you can't, you can't really get luckier to have that guy as like a guitar <laughs> teacher for your first guitar teacher, because it's like, you know, I'd go to his house and he'd have great gear. He'd have great guitars and, and, you know, he'd have, you know, his sensibility for guitar and, um, it's just, you know, really, I was just really lucky. Man, it's so cool. It's funny because I think I took my first 
couple of guitar lessons uh in like must have been 93 94 and there was a teacher here in my hometown that uh uh, I was I met him walking through the mall and he was just like, you know, kind of there. They had a booth uh, on behalf of the local music store and he was trying to like recruit students and it, the place was called the music teacher. And this guy, Dan, uh, like handed me a flyer and he's like, here, want to learn to play guitar? I'm like, actually, I'm learning to play guitar right now. And he's like, he's like, oh, what do you like? I go, well, let me ask you, do you know who Dream Theater is? <laughs> and he was like he was like uh yeah you I mean like like it was all images and words was the only album that was out at the moment and he's like and he, and he picked up a guitar and he's like you know this riff and i'm like oh dude i don't know that was like pull me under you know and <laughs> i was like uh well uh when can i take lessons with you you know and yeah he, um, proved, he proved himself right there on the spot <laughs> on the spot and then i remember the biggest thing in the earliest few lessons was that Every time I picked up, and he had a, a solid Koa Carvin guitar with an ebony thing. It was the first time I even really knew much about Carvin. After that, I was always picking up the Carvin catalogs and all that stuff. Yeah, I had, but, uh, I had, I had a stack of those in my room. Even if you never had a Carvin, you had a Carvin catalog. That, that, like, that was that's a great just, catalog, yeah. Yeah, like dreaming about, oh, I would make mine that color. Fuck that. <laughs> I don't want that. You know, um, but the it was every time I picked up his guitar – it was immaculately set up. The Floyd Rose perfectly balanced everything, all the tension, the height. And he was, he showed me, a, you know, some of that stuff and I started to learn it later. But even when I was still like doing okay at my own setups, you know, like it was, there was nothing like picking up his guitar and playing through his rig. I was like, oh, you know, and, and his other big influence was Al Di Miola. It was Al Di Miola and John Petrucci were like the two big ones. And just that um, young person awe of going in that you were talking about the good. I mean, it wasn't John Petrucci, but it like we were talking about him, you know, and it was like the same type of thing. And he was trying to you know teach me economy of motion, like don't you know don't do this big wild guitar uh, little rock and roll thing. You know, you got to like minimize everything. And uh, I kind of listened, you know, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you never. You, I mean, there are still things that I probably learned in my my first lessons that I still don't do or have, like. <laughs> been really bad about it just you never listen to your first teacher that well <laughs> yeah. you get better at it <laughs> yeah hopefully i mean years and years later I, I was like you know i should go back and and try to learn the less like five six, six years later you know whatever i'm like I should go back mm -hmm. and try and i start to do it i'm like no oh, i'm bored you know like i'm i'm still the same person i'm gonna play the way i'm gonna play to some degree and i've just had to you know do my best to accept that that's where i'm at but uh yeah. That's awesome, man. What a what a what a cool story uh to have JP as as uh Uncle yeah. John. Uncle John, show me your thing. It's it, it it it's so like it's kind of surreal. Um, you know, as I get older and and I'm just like, man, like I had no idea what I was dealing with back then. Like I just was just like, this is just normal, you know. But like at, now that there's like a lot of time removed. I'm just like, man, that was one lucky ass kid. <laughs> mm, mm -hmm. I get one of the comparisons I can make is uh, my friend, uh, my friend Eva Gardner uh, plays bass for uh, Pink and her dad was Kim Gardner. He was in the birds and the creation, like hung with the Rolling Stones. And like she grew up in a household like with all these randos coming by like they and they own they used to own or they still own the cat and the fiddle. Uh, in LA in Hollywood and it's moved it's moved locations and stuff but um, over years of getting to know Eva you know dropping by uh, and her you know us meeting up and stuff and she posted one this photo one day of her like I, I think she was like 10 or 11 and it's her birthday party and and in the photo is like Roger Waters and like um uh, somebody, uh, Keith, Keith Richards, I think from the Rolling Stones, <laughs> she's like an 11th birthday, she's like birthday party. It's uncle, it's uncle Keith and uncle Roger at the house. Like the two biggest rock stars in the world. <laughs> and I'm like, what bro? Like, she's like, yeah, I, it took me a while to understand how lucky of a kid I was because yeah. Roger would stop by and give me a little John Entwistle would stop by the house and give me a bass <laughs> lesson. And I'm yeah. like, oh, fuck. Yeah. So, you know, but she, but she's very, very hyper aware as time has moved on. She's like, oh yeah, yeah not very few people have the, the uncles or the circle, you know? So, yeah. You know, you know, to... 
I, it, it's, there's a little bit of regret behind it too. Cause it's just like, man, I wish I appreciated it more. It's not that I didn't appreciate mm. it, but kids appreciating things are different than adults appreciating things. And I wish that, you know, that was one instance where that wasn't true. And I kind of like knew like, man, I better pay, better pay real close attention. And I better make like, try to go to these lessons as much as possible. And, you know, that's, that's like my only regret, but when you're a kid, you don't know those things. So I can't, you could, there's no way to help it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know that the, the two ever line up. Right. Because I think it's a, it's a, it's an element of youth to not know what you have, you know, in, in the way of time, in the way of energy, in the way of all the access to things. Yeah. And it's the way of being older and only by looking back, can we go, wow. Uh, okay. So I understand it better. Now there's a, con I have the ability, I have the context now to, to appreciate it. Um, and yeah. And, you know, all I can do is wish that I could have had more of this appreciation at that time, but yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's like they say the, the youth is wasted on the young, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a good saying. Uh, um, I'm curious about um, with this new album, is is there a highlight moment for you on the album uh like do you have a favorite track or and because i don't know exactly who's playing what solos on there you know um maybe you can point out is there a favorite solo that you have on there that you can tell us about um so uh there's there's four like guitar solos on the record two of them are by mark and two of them are by me um actually no there, there's there's if you count the one in wildfire as like the first track as like a solo, that would be Misha. Um, and then there's like lead lines that Misha plays. Um, but it's tough for me to like pick a favorite solo just because they both like make my hair fall out, like thinking about playing them. Oh no. It's so stressful. Um, but I think I have like the Zagreus solo down really, really well. Like I can play the hell out of it, like blindfolded. I wouldn't need to like look at the fretboard or whatever. But the one I'm really worried about is the one in the song Dracul Gras, which is the second to last track. Um, it was the first time that I wrote like a minute long solo. It's like a minute and change. And there's just so many licks in there that are pretty challenging. And they're kind of at the limit of my ability tempo wise. So um, that one's going to be interesting. Be oh, and it's also played on an eight string. So playing oh. solos on an eight string is pretty awful because the tension is is eight string tension so right. it's going to be uh it's going to be interesting to see like if i can pull that one off live but um it's uh i'm very proud of it and uh i like the way that it sounds but it you know just think kind of thinking about it i get a little worried because i know the mm. guys are going to want to play that song live and uh, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of frustrations over that solo um but uh Favorite moment on the record is probably like the ending of Wax Wings. And it's because like Mark brought that the this unique tuning to, to the session that day. And we kind of came up with that song. And it was like the first time that I was really writing something that forced me out of my comfort zone in terms of like using familiar shapes and phrasing and kind of feeling really comfortable. I had to write something that was incredibly uncomfortable, but ended up being some of like the stuff I've been most proud of melodically. And it kind of like hit something that I've been chasing for a really long time, which is like kind of coming up with this sort of melodic motif that isn't complicated, but it's really impactful. And mm -hmm. I think I, I think I, I think I uh, got that on, on the end of that, on the end of that song. So that'd probably be my other pick. Cool. Uh, it's the ending of wax wing yeah okay. i'll go back and listen i'm just curious um, and mark mark wrote a solo over that progression so that's kind of like and then misha did all the orchestration so it's just like the end of wax wings is this kind of like that's what happens when all three of us work very intently on one section so mm. it's a good example there that's cool yeah and that's worth uh, okay it's worth for me to go back and listen to that now with that extra information, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and what, what, what is the, I'm skipping back. Uh, I meant to ask earlier, what, is there a, I, I don't, I'm sorry that I don't know this. Uh, do you have a, a name for your side project or your solo project? 
Uh, it's just my it's just my name just Jake Jake Bowen. Bowen. yeah oh, okay. I, I i wanted to name it something i'm just not like clever enough and then like i don't know if i'm like i get worried about picking something and then like not liking it so you know at least i get the name the albums and stuff so yeah it's uh it's if you just search my name on like spotify or any any place that you stream music um my solo stuff is up there and it's kind of just like chill electronic music you know you can put it on the background it won't Awesome. <laughs> love that style of music man, man I, I actually live on that style of music a, after the end of the day you know like i love mellow stuff that i don't have that doesn't make me think or doesn't draw my attention too hard you know yeah yeah i i, I kind of that's my main music co- consumption right there is like really chill stuff you know i put it on like if i'm making dinner or something it's like my cooking music or it's like you know if I'm gaming, I'll put that kind of stuff on. And uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much uh, my favorite style of music. Mm. I remember, do you still have uh, your, your dog? Yeah. Yeah. He's it's upstairs like, right now. It, wait, yeah. What kind of dog is it? He's an Alaskan Klikai. I got a picture Klikai. of him. Right here. It's a little dusty. Hang on a second. All right. <laughs> oh, there he is. What a cutie. That's my man, Tycho. Tycho, that's right, Tycho. Yeah. Great band, too, Tycho. Yeah, I love Tycho. That's the vibe of music that we're just talking about, kind of, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the, exactly what I'd put on, something like that. Yeah. Matter of fact, I think Devin's the one that made me listen to Tycho first. He was like, hey, man, <laughs> when you need to chill it out and not do all this other stuff. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He listens to a lot of that stuff, and um, he got me turned on to that uh, playlist, uh, Ambient Sleeping Pill. Um, oh, yeah. It's just like, and it's like true ambient stuff. It's not a lot of people like call electronic music ambient just because it sounds like soft, but it still has a pulse. But this is more like soundscapey, sort of no no discernible po- pulse, but just a vibe. Yeah, well, that that makes sense. Have you, have you heard any of his super ambient stuff that he's done recently? Yeah, yeah, he's great at it too. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. Like he he turned me on to a bunch of stuff. Yeah, prior to that, but then he started putting out the the loops, kind of like he, that. The one piece he put out a couple improvisations, and then he put out this the last one, which was called Dream Piece, I think. And I I use it all the time. I I teach yoga on the side at, uh, five five days a week, um, and in the softer moments, in the rest section that i use his piece a lot because it's oh, so, so cool. relaxing and spacious and i've had a handful of people like hey, what is this that we're listening to and i'm like yeah oh, i bet i bet. ever heard of a band called strapping young lad yeah <laughs> you should look them up first and then come back <laughs> yeah you gotta you gotta be like uh you gotta be um you gotta check this out first because you can't have any posers you gotta listen to this yeah, and then- <laughs> yeah. i'm not even i'm not gonna send you this link until you check you to check out love by strapping on lad yeah. and then and then i'll send you the, the follow-up link and what now your mind is blown it's the same guy yeah <laughs> different era but same guy yeah yeah that's awesome well i'm curious like growing up did you uh like with your parents and your family stuff did you did you grow up with like a a religious slanted at all and 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 whether you did or didn't do you did have you evolved any type of you know belief system or anything that kind of that you anchor around or you kind of feel like you know agnostic or something like I'm that glad you asked that question i feel like people avoid questions like this because they're like they feel like uh it's inappropriate or it's like offensive like it'll offend someone but i i, I love questions like this because it's like a, you know a lot of what i think about is kind of like the nature of why mm-hmm. um but growing up, I never really had any sort of like rigid religious household. Like I think my family kind of aligned with Roman Catholics, but um, my my mom I had a long term boyfriend that was Jewish. So like I was I did Jewish holidays as well, and um, you know I just kind of got both those sides of it. But I never really like felt any sort of like I never had like leaned in any one direction really, and um it's kind of like i i try not to be too presumptuous about the universe and its purpose for us you know i just kind of like you know it is what it is you know maybe we're not entitled to an answer maybe you know maybe it's just you know we're here 
we're like the universe's way of like observing itself, you know? So it's like, I try not to, um, I try not to form like super rigid beliefs around like the why or, or, or who we are or what happens after or whatever. It's just like in due time, you know, oblivion comes for us all and, you know, who knows what it's going to be like. So I don't really try to stress myself out trying to, um, uh, understand. Um, cause like when you think about it, like we're not really like our, we're just like a combination of our senses. Right. And our senses aren't that great. Like our sense of smell isn't that great. Like our sense of eyesight isn't that great. Mm -hmm. You know, we lose our hearing pretty easily, you know, and it's just kind of like, we see the, the universe in this kind of like low resolution version of what we perceive. So, um, it's hard to trust what, you know, and then also we compute it in these, these imperfect, these strangely perfect, but imperfect computers in our head. And that's all clouded by like, you know, what we experience down here on earth. And we really have no perception of what's going on around us. But anyways, I'm getting too abstract and weird. So I guess I'll okay. just say like, um, it's, it's important for me to make sure that when I interact with people that they are taken care of and they feel good. And that's kind of like my belief system. I just, I, I don't want people to suffer. Uh, other than that, I don't like really think much beyond, you know, what I can observe. Mm. Cool, sir. I, 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 I can relate to it in a multitude of ways. And, um, I'm reminded of, uh, one of my favorite books, actually, uh, The Way of the Peaceful Warrior. I don't know if you're familiar with it at all. I've heard it's of a, it. It's a, it was released back in the 70s or something like that, and I still re revisit it probably almost every year. Um, but it's a partial true story about this gymnast, right, that like gets in a motorcycle wreck and kind of gets uh, leveled, basically. He gets humbled. He was kind of a pompous guy, uh, and then and then, and, uh, he had met this – he meets this kind of mentor at a gas station in the middle of the night. He can't sleep. And he goes there and, and this guy uh, is affectionately called Socrates or he, he kind of he nicknames him Socrates. And in the, the little movie they did, Nick Nolte plays the character, which is kind of perfect for this particular character. But when he, he, he tells Dan, uh, you know, uh, all, all these little tidbits of like information around, around life. Cause Dan's, you know, kind of pompous young person thinks he's really good and then gets, humbled and has to kind of relearn uh learn a different way of, of seeing the world and interacting um and in the process you know he's dropping all these bits of wisdom and he says uh he says you know three three rules in life you know uh paradox you know uh things are not always what they seem and two things can be true at the same time he's like humor it's like uh you know or paradox humor and change is what he, what he what he says you know um and and he's like humor is like develop a sense of humor about yourself uh, about the world and about your life especially about yourself right like that's super important and then change uh all it, things are always changing um and in and in the process of of navigating that change don't spend too much time trying to figure life out like you're a matter of fact actually i think he atta attaches that to paradox in the beginning he says something about like you know it's it's a trip you're not going to figure this out don't spend too much time trying to sort out the details more important to to know that you know uh keep your sense of humor and that all things are changing you know yeah and i think i think the sense of humor thing is really important because it's like you i think a lot of people struggle with the fact that they are not in full control of their lives or like that they're not they're not you know, the, the concept of free will is a completely abstract thought that we are, you know, we struggle to wrangle with and keeping kind of like a, you know, keeping sense of humor at the forefront of that will really prevent a lot of disappointment because, you know, it's just like, that's the way the universe is. The universe chews you up and spits you out, you know, <laughs> live life and, and enjoy it and laugh at it. And, uh, you know, try not to take it too seriously because we really are just you know, organisms on a rock at the end of the day. And, um, you know, it, that in a, in of itself is kind of funny. Um, cause we're able to like converse on this level, but really at the end of the day, 
or not much in the great scheme. So it's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah. I, I a hundred percent agree. I, um, <laughs> the, 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 the part where, uh, I'm a I'm a big big fan of Alan Watts too. Like I don't know if you've ever listened to Alan Watts much. He's pretty popular in like the mellow music realm too. The, I haven't, the, but I, I've also again I've heard of I've heard of him. Yeah, I mean the people you probably heard him in some ambient song or somewhere they had a quote and somebody he was saying something profound, you know. And I was just listening to uh, there's a his son put out like he started last year. He's got like 400 hours of his dad talking you know, uh, from the sixties and into the seventies wow. before he died. And, uh, and one of the sessions is only like, like they, he basically is going to go through all 400 hours on this like new podcast that they started last year. And, and he kind of intros and all that stuff. But one of the, one of the things was because, you know, you always hear, it's kind of cliche, like, Oh, we're all one man, bro. Like, it's like, it's just hippy dippy dude. Like you and me, we're the same thing, man. And, uh, and, and I, I've always been like, yeah, and I'm like, but how? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, because I mean, I mean, I think I get it, but like, I, I'm not sure that I get it, you know. And there was, and every once in a while, I, I, I've listened to a lot of Alan Watts, but the other day, it was like the second episode come on, came on, and it was like, he's like, look, he 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 has this kind of reminding you. He's like, if if I am me because you are you, and you are you because I am me then I'm not me and you're not you, <laughs> you know, we're, we're two sides to the same coin yeah. and uh, we we're interdependent, so to speak. And we're, and we're inseparable, right? The you and me aspect, the up and down aspect, the polarity, the left and the right, you don't, you don't just get left. You know, you also yeah. get, you always get right. It infers right. The up infers the down and all this stuff. And, and so he goes deeper and deeper in all these different ways of explaining it, but it's like the environment you find yourself in infers your existence. hundred percent. Yeah. We are, we are reflections of like how people view us, you know? So it's like without, without, if we were here alone, we wouldn't be anything. And that's, you know, that's a paradox. So. Mm -hmm. um, Hey man, well that's a good place to start wrapping it up. I was uh, thank you so much, Jake, for for uh, taking the time to chat with me. I know you got another session coming up. Um, and yeah, no uh, thanks for man, thanks for having me on. It was fun, dude. Super super proud of you guys. Uh, super big congratulations to everybody involved in the new album. It slays, and it's yet another like sweet artistic expression from the uh, organism that is Periphery. You know? Thank you. Thank so. you. Thank you. It makes me, it makes me happy that you feel that way about it. Um, hopefully we, we run into each other. Uh, where, where are you located now? I'm in Northern California. I'm about an hour uh, North of Sacramento in Chico, California. Okay. Um, you know sometimes... where, we, you know where Wheatland is? Wheatland. Yeah, definitely. I, I don't know. That's, it might be in the middle of nowhere from like, or pretty far from you, but we're, we'll be there in a couple of weeks. So. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'll look it up. I don't remember how far, but I do, I do remember. Uh, yeah. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll reach out if to it's you reason, If it's reasonable, you know, I'll put you on the list, you know, no that'd problem. be great. Yeah. yeah, man. Thank you for the, for the generosity. And um, I, I will see you out on the road. Maybe you guys will come through NAM in April, or I don't know if that's a thing this year, really, if many people are coming or not, but I don't know. I wasn't invited. So <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm inviting you. Oh, thank you. Come thank on you. down, hang out. Let's go to dinner. You know? that sounds fun. Cool. Well, uh, best to you and the rest of your day, man. And uh, we'll be in touch. All right, Chris. I'll talk to you soon. Players Kick Podcast. Picks and Perspective with Chris Johnson. This episode of Players Pick Podcast is brought to you in part by our good friends at Jim Dunlop Guitar Products, Kiesel Custom Guitars, Roswell Pro Audio and Microphones, Happy Cable Company, Copper Sound Pedals, and our favorite coffee company, Road Roaster Coffee. Go to roadroastercoffee.com and use coupon code PLAYERSPICK to receive 15% off all orders ongoing forever. forever. Well, isn't that nice?